Watch this. The mandatory minimum bill is moving forward at the Idaho State House, adding fentanyl to a list of drugs guaranteeing a prison sentence and maybe a murder charge. That part was the center of today's testimony. The JFAC jumble continues with more closed door meetings around whether they're sticking with the new way or going back to the old way. Well, they did manage to pass one budget today before putting the whole thing on pause once again. Miscarriages are maybe more common than you think and apparently getting treatment for them might be as tricky as getting treatment for an abortion in Idaho, according to one family and their dealings with their pharmacist. All right, buckle up. We're talking about budgets again here at the, uh, well, at the State House here yeah. on the 208. Another exciting day, or I guess it's all relative when it comes to what is going on at the State House, but lots of debate continuing both in the floors and the hallways of the legislature on how lawmakers should attack these budgets. Leaders of the JFAC committee say the new process meant to be more transparent, more interactive, easier to work through. We've talked about this the last couple of days, couple of weeks, in fact. But the critics say that's creating bad budgets that won't even keep the lights on for some of these agencies. Okay, so yesterday they s separated, went their separate ways, talked about this for a while. Did they do more of that today? Well, they took one vote, and we'll talk about that in a second, but, well... There's a lot of talking to be okay. done still. Uh, we're still waiting, though, to see exactly how this process will unfold. But we did get an indication on what the temperature is in the room, and the room being the House chambers. And to begin the day, lawmakers in the House knew that they had big votes on an initial batch of budgets. And they are big votes because they're the first maintenance budgets up for vote. And that word, maintenance, is a key conflict word. The concept from JFAC is to pass budgets to essentially keep the lights on as a base budget, and then lawmakers would circle back later in the session to add line items, replacement, supplemental stuff. Critics of the idea say that there's no guarantee that lawmakers will circle back and that the maintenance budgets, they aren't really that, but instead bare, bare bone budgets. JFAC leaders, they dispute both of those assertions. So when the first maintenance budget came on on the House floor docket this morning, it happened to be the judicial budget. So lawmakers, yes, they were voting on the budget, but they were really also voting on the process. And critics say it's just not working. I think we all share the same objective of ensuring that we have a budget process in place that allows for certainty going forward, transparency that allows us to actually identify individual items within the budgets placed before us, and the opportunity to actually ask questions about what our agencies are requesting of us in the process and to make the assessment of whether or not we are providing true maintenance for our state agencies. Okay, so that's the real crux of the debate, but supporters of the new process say that it works. JFAC co-chair, Representative Wendy Horman, answered questions about the process using the judicial maintenance budget as the living example of coming budgets. I respect that everyone in this room might have a, defi a different definition of maintenance. And because I happen to know who sets the agendas, for the Joint Finance Appropriation Committee, I can assure you that hearings are scheduled and will happen for the other needs that the courts have identified that they have that are new spending or a new funding source so again, we're talking about the judicial budget specifically, but this applies to all the maintenance budgets. So long story short, the maintenance budget did pass the House floor, 38 to 31 with one lawmaker absent. But lawmakers broke into a long caucus right after the vote. They also broke into another meeting right after the floor session. So Brian, I've been trying to get the word from down what's going on in those backroom meetings. Don't have an official decision yet, but again, we know this is gonna be a debate on process. Okay, so 38, 31, does that seem like a close vote? Like too close generally? It's a pretty close vote, and kind of what you have is different factions of the Republican parties partnering up with the Democrats. And so it's going to be very interesting to see how that gets, you know, uh, talked about, number one, in terms of people working together and who's a real Republican, who's not a real Republican. But it's going to get complicated. And there is a situation where uh, they're going to vote on Friday on more budgets. It'll be interesting to see what process they use. And assuming they don't go to another caucus. All right, right, thank you very much, Joe. All right, one of the more controversial bills bouncing around the state house is just 18 yay votes away from the governor's desk. The Senate Judiciary and Rules Committee passed House Bill 406 onto the full chamber. It adds fentanyl to the list of drugs in Idaho carrying mandatory minimum punishment. 
which is now a good time for me and the camera to bring Andrew <laughs> into this process. Way to play off that. Yeah, and has covered this bill all session. It's kind of touchy because it passed through the House Judiciary and Rules and Admin Committee mm -hmm. without a recommendation, this bill did, which isn't a common thing to do. But mandatory minimum, taking judges' opinion out of the equation, that's one thing. But there's a secondary section of this bill that was talked about today, getting a little bit more pushback. Yeah, and that without a recommendation, we're actually seeing that a bit this session, which mm -hmm. is an interesting piece to me. But that other section of this, it's called drug-induced homicide. It's a clause that's sort of a bottom piece of this legislation. Now, we've previously reported the bill as it creates a new crime by that same name, drug-induced homicide, which is true. But in committee, Senator James Ruckty made it clear it's not just for fentanyl. If you give anyone a Schedule One drug that would include something like heroin, cocaine, and it kills that person you gave it to, even if it's an accident, regardless of intent, the bill wants to prosecute that as homicide. And former Ada County prosecutor Gene Fisher wants none of it. She says that targets the user, not the dealer, which is the intention of the main bill. It goes against the rest of the bill to target traffickers. She says it's red tape at best, but more likely it's meaningless and confusing. In the conversations that I have had, even with some of the law enforcement officers I've talked to, even one prosecutor that I talked to, when I asked, why do you want drug, why do we want this drug-induced homicide? Why? And routinely, they have all said, yeah, it's, we're never going to use this bill, and causation is really hard to prove. And it's a terrible thing to do, to be in a situation, to have that grieving parent come to you, begging for you to do something when you know that you can't or you won't. And they already know that right now. And so do most of you. Fisher adds, involuntary manslaughter. It's already on the books right now in state law, and it already covers a death linked to bad drugs like an overdose, or it could be used for that. It makes this session of the bill unnecessary. Again, that's according to Fisher. Now, the main portion of the bill is strictly about creating mandatory minimums for fentanyl. In one word, supporters call it a deterrent. We hear that recurring. Now, three lawmakers who oppose the bill in testimony sort of hung up on this term intent. If you have enough drugs, you are considered a trafficker under mandatory minimums. Police do not need to prove your intent to sell. They say the amount alone is sufficient. That's what this law would agree with and put into law. Now, this is when the room got hot. Testimony on behalf of the human of human trafficking victims, I should say. She says this bill would also target victims of human trafficking. She says it would drop the hammer on those people who need help and compassion drug trafficking and human trafficking are interconnected. Victim of human trafficking will become more involved in the drug markets, typically playing low-level, nonviolent roles, and they will be the last link in the system that ultimately will be the individuals that will be penalized um, as the unintended consequences of these harsh laws. So if, if someone who's trapped in human trafficking gets arrested, is that an opportunity for them to break out of that system, maybe to get some help, but if they're charged with a mandatory minimum, uh, that opportunity uh, isn't presented to them. It's really about the, um, the intent, right, and the judges making that decision to, one, identify a victim, law enforcement giving them the tools to identify victims. They are more scared than law enforcement than their own traffickers. I'm offended by that statement. That's the last thing we do. There may have been a day in the past when, when sex trafficking was considered a vice crime. Those days are long gone. If they're a victim, they're a victim, and we treat them as a victim, and we do everything we can to give them the opportunity to get out of that, to get away from the abuser, the trafficker, the controller, get them into programs, and get them to a safe spot. If these people have to do some time, we pray and hope they get the programming they deserve in prison. Sometimes it's kind of harsh, but the, re the harsh reality is if you don't do that, they stay out there until either they die or they kill someone else. So a big piece of that, uh, Kenyon County Sheriff Kieran Donahue, his county does a good job compared to the other counties in the state in terms of uh, managing human trafficking, mm -hmm. finding that crime and prosecuting it as such. But a good piece, I can't remember the lawmaker that said it, or, or maybe it was in testimony, we make laws for the bad acting types. The, the lowest common denominator, not for the exemplary ones. And so there might be police departments where that isn't the case. Okay. So that was kind of the argument put forth. But 
Regardless, six to three, it passed. It's moving to the Senate floor, one step away from the governor's desk. Did it pass with or without a rec or with no recommendation? I believe it was no recommendation. So again, it's held true that this one's going forward without a recommendation from either committee. We'll double check on that. If okay. we're wrong, we'll correct it at the end of the show. All right. Thanks, Andrew. All right. Are sex and gender the same thing? According to actual scientists, no. That's too simplistic. But according to a majority of Idaho lawmakers, yes, they are. Not only are the terms interchangeable, there are only two of them. That's according to House Bill 421, which cleared the full House today by a vote of 54 to 14. The bill, sponsored by Republican Representative Julianne Young from Blackfoot, is meant to provide, quote, consistency across state statute. But critics claim the legislation singles out Idahoans who don't fit either category, male or female, or are transgender. And they wonder why it's necessary. This bill, it, it doesn't fix a road. It doesn't get rid of grocery tax. It doesn't, you know, repair broken ceilings in schools. This, it doesn't get anybody health care. This doesn't do anything to make anybody's life any better. It only harms. Really, the only thing that this bill accomplishes is make an already vulnerable, beleaguered minority feel further persecuted and feel that their government just wants to, to legislate them out of existence. This is an ongoing question that is pertinent to every Idahoan, to teachers, to policemen, to us as policymakers. These questions of male and female and when it is and is not appropriate to have differential treatment and protections in the law is a salient question of our time and I think it's time to provide some clear definition so we can have that conversation. Definition now up for debate again. It's House Bill 421 now in the hands of the Idaho Senate. I think that that's what's hard for folks that don't have a medical background to understand is that that is the area we always deal in is gray area and, and we're constantly weighing our decisions of, of these are the probabilities, what decision do you want to make as the patient? Uh, it's almost never a clear cut answer on most of medicine. That is Dr. Lauren Colson, a family physician who provides obstetrics and reproductive care to the Treasure Valley. That interview was done the day the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade on June 24th, 2022. And that Dobbs decision triggered Idaho's abortion ban, putting doctors in a position to be prosecuted for performing or helping a woman to have an abortion. He was talking about the muddled mess that that put doctors in. Would that bill or that law go into effect? And that day, he was explaining his concern, not really knowing what situations would warrant an abortion when it comes to saving the life of a mother, because that was the definition. Because nothing is ever 100% certain, as he told us. One thing Dr. Colson was sure of, he didn't expect two years later, or nearly that, he would be talking publicly about what happened to his wife, that Idaho's abortion laws would lead to issues on how to handle a miscarriage, of which there are three ways. You could have a surgical procedure, known as a DNC, which is taken care of that day. You could take some medicine, which takes a couple of days, but it's convenient, safer option for a lot of women. Or you could rely on what is called expectant management, where the body expels the pregnancy itself, but that could take weeks or months and is unpredictable. 
Here's what happened when Kristen Colson was offered those options. Um, Dr. Lauren Colson. Yeah, yeah, it's been yeah about three, three and a half years. And his wife, Kristen, have been and trying for a while to have a baby. Then several weeks ago. It was um, not this last Friday, but the previous Friday. Kristen found out she was pregnant again. This time uh, we went in for our ultrasound and we had what's called an an embryonic pregnancy where a gestational sac will grow in the uterus, but there isn't an embryo that's growing with it um, or the embryo grew and was reabsorbed. I mean, it's a very clear non-viable pregnancy. Kristen is familiar with a non-viable pregnancy, having miscarried multiple times which means she's also familiar with her options. It's called expectant management, where your body um, resolves the um, miscarriage on its own. And then there's also um, a procedure called a DNC. So it's a surgical procedure. There's also medication that you can take and it's prescribed by your physician. You chose the medication? Yes, I chose the medication uh, based on my past history um, and my experiences with the other options. I felt that the medication was the best option for me with this pregnancy. The medication she was prescribed was misoprostol, which causes the uterus to contract to expel a non-viable pregnancy. It's also one of the drugs used in an abortion. So your doctor gave you a prescription mm -hmm. and you took it to the pharmacy? Yes, it, it was immediately sent to my pharmacy after my doctor's visit. And then what happened? Um, typically, I get a text message when my prescriptions are ready from my local pharmacy, and I didn't receive a text message that day. So finally, so Kristen asked. called and asked the pharmacist. And they shared with me that um, they were not going to fill the prescription. They did not feel comfortable filling the prescription at that dosage um, due to the Idaho laws. Idaho laws, as they pertain to abortion, would make anyone helping to perform that procedure liable to time in prison, a fine, and a loss of their medical license. What did you say? I was shocked and confused, frankly. Did they give any other explanation besides that? No, they um, recommended that I call my doctor's office and have the prescription sent to another pharmacy. What was that like for you? It was hard. I mean, anyone that's gone through a miscarriage, it's a very emotional and um, sad time to begin with. and. You know, thinking that I can just go to my phar pharmacy, get this prescription filled, and, you know, we can resolve this. It, it was frustrating. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of concern um, around medications like misoprostol that are also part of a regimen if you are having an abortion as well. Um, and for the pharmacists, I think, just like us as physicians, sometimes that there's a lot of ambiguity with the laws where people aren't quite sure, or don't understand exactly what they can and can't do. And so where does my liability begin? We wanted to get a pharmacist perspective. What boxes do I have to check in order to make sure this is a legal prescription? Do you think pharmacists are wary of kind of fulfilling some of these prescriptions based on Idaho's abortion laws? I do. Well, I mean, you think it's it's much easier to just not fill a prescription. Um, that's the kind of the easy way out. The safe way. It's the safe way out. And I think it's out of abundance of caution. You know, no one wants to violate a law. But if the education isn't coming down from the state or if the law isn't clear, then it's really hard to make those distinctions. The pregnancy complications. That lack of clarity is why Dr. Colson wanted to take his wife's story public. Posting on social media, because of Idaho laws, so that's cool, the day it happened. When uh, Lauren wanted to kind of take it out in the public, mm -hmm. were you okay with that? Absolutely. I think that it's important for people to hear these stories and get a better understanding of the impact that the laws are having on the community. Do you think that raising awareness and, and like bringing attention to this will change anything? I hope so. Miscarriages are incredibly common. And so while this happened to Kristen and this happened to us and, and we're being public about this, this is happening to tons of people throughout the state all the time. And I think for our legislators and others to realize how common it is, people need to talk about it. And that's a big reason why we decided to talk about it. Kristen told us she's fortunate to be married to a physician who specializes in reproductive care, so she knew 
what was allowed and what wasn't, she knew this pharmacist was likely misinterpreting the law. They live in Boise, and she was able to get her prescription filled at another pharmacy. But she said she was also worried about those women who live in smaller towns across Idaho with fewer options. Dr. Colson pointed out miscarriages, yes, they are common. According to the National Library of Medicine, as many as 26% of all pregnancies end in miscarriage. So likely there are going to be women who run into this problem at some point, which is why at his clinic, they just keep medications like this, this misoprostol, on hand so patients can avoid any hassle of a pharmacist's refusal. Both he and the pharmacist would like to see some directive. That'd be Matt Murray from Custom Medica that we spoke with today. Both he and Colson would like to see some directive and education from the state to clear up any confusion when it comes to miscarriage medications and treatment. So we don't have any big impact weather heading down the pipeline in the next 48 hours or so, but there's probably still a few things that you may notice. So tomorrow we're looking at some slightly cooler temperatures, roughly between five and seven degrees for both the morning lows and the highs. And we're still see some light mountain snow lingering in some of those mountain locations. Again, light accumulations, one to two inches. But then as we get closer to Friday, this will probably what you'll notice the most is that we'll start to see snow chances return for all elevations. And those accumulations still look to be light for valleys, but I know it will probably feel a little different coming back into the snow rather than the rain. And also let's look at those low temperatures tomorrow. I mentioned it being slightly cooler. You can see back to freezing for the expected low for Boise and you can see teens even for some central mountain areas and below freezing over in portions of the Magic Valley. And so with that snow, probably on Friday, you'll want to just give yourself maybe an extra five minutes for your morning drive and your evening drive as we start to see the snow move in from both those valley locations and in the mountains. Again, it's unlikely that we get more than an inch in some of those valley locations, but here you can see it still moving through Friday afternoon. So that's something that we'll continue to look at as well. Here's our high temperatures for today. You can see close to 50 degrees for a lot of those spots, but otherwise we'll be sticking with those more mild temperatures on the way for us.
All right, a couple of comments to share with you here at the end of the show on Wednesday. Representative Rubel gives an articulate and sensible reasoning against equating sex and gender. It's baffling. The other legislators can't seem to understand it, says Jan. So if Word Girl's bill passes, that'd be Representative Julianne Young, self-proclaimed Word Girl. It is signed, binary trans and others will actually not exist in Idaho. I wonder if they will be able to still drive, get insurance, own a home, or any other rights males or females only will still have, asks Steve. That's a very good question. Let's be clear, the new budget process is to scrutinize agency budgets for anything the MAGA crowd doesn't like. Primarily, BSU and U of I will get hammered. The mythical CRT and inclusion and equity boogeymen, says Rob. That one might be coming up sooner than you think. For couples trying to become parents, miscarriage is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking enough without having to navigate medical providers and pharmacists who have their hands tied by Idaho's confusing abortion laws, says Kathy Neagle. One thing that uh, Dr. Colson and his wife Kristen talked about today, something they didn't have to think about a year, few years ago when they were considering and wanting to have a family, was what to do if there are complications with a pregnancy, like planning to go visit family in another state or getting life light insurance because of Idaho's laws. All those things are now having to be considered by a lot of families who may be in the same situation. We'll talk about something else, maybe the same thing, but more stuff tomorrow. We'll see you then.